Jamie and I both grew up in South Dakota. Now, South Dakota is on the Great Plains, and we get these very interesting weather patterns. You see, we have this massive flat valley, and it's not like completely flat, but it's fairly flat out there. And from the north, you get the cold winds from Canada, and from the south, you get the warm winds from the Caribbean. But when they clash in the middle, you get these violent thunderstorms. Now, we had a thunderstorm here yesterday, right? It was, it was pretty fierce. The wind blew and things like that. But on the Great Plains, it's just a bit different. Some mornings you can see them building all day long, moving towards you. And when they finally arrive, they darken the midday sun and they begin to blow these hurricane-like winds. And as they build on top of you and release it, it feels as though the entire sky has been darkened and you've returned to nighttime. As they move off to the east, you can see the flashes of lightning as the sun illuminates the backs of the clouds. And the world turns magical as rainbows begin to appear. Now, some of these can be quite heavy with moisture. Sometimes you get an entire month's moisture, up to three to four inches, in a matter of minutes or within less than an hour. But they're also very spotty. So, for example, you could literally drive 10 miles in a different direction, north or south, and there would be no water and no evidence of the storm at all. Now, of course, the storms themselves are awe-inspiring, but they're also sometimes dangerous and very deadly. Sometimes the sky turns green. Now, when the sky turns green, it means that hail is going to be coming. And in these hailstorms, there are plenty of stories from people where they hear of dead animals or people who got caught in the hailstorm and ended up with severe injuries or death. And some of these hailstones can grow to the size of a baseball and or softball. Dad used to tell us one story that when growing up, it was a late July before the wheat harvest and all the wheat had turned a beautiful golden brown. And it was days before the harvest and in that afternoon, the sky turned green. And after the storm had passed, they looked out upon their field, and not a single piece of wheat could be harvested. Within 30 minutes, everything had been leveled to the ground. Windows break, cars are dented, farm animals are vulnerable without the shelter. If you're in a steel roof or a steel storage shed, the sound is deafening. Then there was the day when I was working for my boss and we were near the river and we were picking up these small square bells. They're about this big by this big by this big and you haul them to the trailer and you throw them up. It's a great football exercise or at least that's what my boss kept telling me. On this particular day we were loading a flatbed when my boss's son who was older than us came rushing out into the field with a pickup and two flatbeds as they were bouncing behind he was furiously pointing to the western skies and as we turned around we noticed that the sky had turned massively dark and off about 30 miles it was a small funnel cloud was visible well <laughs> He put the truck in low gear, got out of it, pointed it straight, locked the steering wheel, and for the next 25 minutes, we threw bales as though our lives depended on it, because in some ways, our lives did depend on it. Within 30 minutes, we had two flatbeds full. We had just got the trailer into the shed when the first hailstone hit, and for the next 15 minutes, we watched as the ground turned white, with little hailstones all over the place. Even with modern advancements, oftentimes the storm had passed by the time we had heard about it on the radio. So the local radio station would tell us that a storm was coming in the midst of trying to listen because the rain and the winds were so heavy. Most of the time when the thunderstorms arrived, you just ceased work. You couldn't do anything. You hunkered down in a shed or inside the house. It was almost as if Mother Nature was telling you, you're done. You're just absolutely done. You can't do 
anything. So sometimes we would stand in the entryway of sheds and just watch the pouring rain come down in sheets. Other times we went into the house and raided the pantry for cookies, much to the chagrin of my boss's wife, who came home and found all her cookies were missing. And sometimes we watched the television to just see how bad this storm actually was because you didn't have a perspective outside of the storm. Now, it makes sense that the thunderstorms and God's voice are often one in the same, particularly to the ancient people and to the biblical witness. We have a number of stories that when people come face to face, the only response is to sit and watch to sit and be in awe, because in that moment, like the storms, there's nothing you can do. Now, this type of chaos also allows a certain amount of reflection to take place, because the chaos is so great that there is nothing else that one can do, and it grinds all activity to a halt. And so it's disorienting, and it's so disorienting to a point that it's almost reorienting. The season of Lent, the journey of Lent, offers that type of invitation. It's the invitation to stop in the midst of the chaos and often pull back in the darkness and listen to the voice of God. We are often overwhelmed and taken aback by what has happened. So Lent becomes this deliberate time in the Christian calendar this deliberate time of darkness that we are invited to enter into the chaos. For most of our lives, we create order. We make schedules. We send emails. We have bedtimes. We have wake-up times. We have dinner. We have suppers. We have breakfast. We have coffee breaks. We have these moments. We have alarms. We make order out of the chaos around us. But it is during this time that we're invited to willfully enter into that chaos, to see the chaos as a time to stop and be awestruck by it. There are many times in the biblical witness that describes God and God's character as being in the middle of that chaos. And in the middle of the darkness, in our Job passage, it describes God's voice as thundering, thundering so loud. There can be no conversation. There can be no thinking. For those of you with little kids who desire to be loud, that's that moment where you can't think and you just want peace and quiet. And so with God's voice, there's that chance to stop. In our passage in Revelation, God's voice causes spontaneous worship in which the only response is they fall down and worship in awe of God. And so just as the thunderstorms on the Great Plains shut down all of our farming activities, so too can God's voice invite us to stop our activity and just listen. And in some ways, the chaos makes it easy to hone in on what is important or imperative. Sometimes in our life when we are so overwhelmed with responsibilities or something so tragic has happened, we stop to reevaluate what life is really about or what those priorities are. When it feels so overwhelming, we are often able to discover what things are most important. Stripped away of our own power in the face of the storm, we come face to face with our own weakness our own inadequacies, our own ineptitude at ordering this world. The strongest person, the wisest elder, the shrewdest individual finds themselves that they cannot utilize the tools and the skills that they have learned in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the chaos. They cannot manipulate the world around them to improve their situation. Instead, it's simply the sobering reality that all our efforts are for naught in the face of the thunder and chaos. Plans have been laid to waste. Goals have been dashed. Hopes have been squashed by the thundering chaos. Martin Luther was traveling home from law school to visit his parents some 90 kilometers away. On his way, he encountered a thunderstorm so fierce 
that he thought he was going to die. And it is during those moments where he clung to a rock in the middle of a village and begged God that if God would just help him survive, that he would then take it upon himself to dedicate his life and enter into the priesthood. Well, he did survive the storm, and Martin Luther took that as an omen, and Martin Luther entered the seminary. And we know that things changed because of those moments. But let's take a moment to acknowledge something. Not all chaos is beneficial. Not all chaos is healthy. Seeking chaos is not a path that should be sought out. As Christians, our primary calling is to participate and build the kingdom of God as adopted family members, not to spread chaos in order to help people seek or get clarity. And also, not every chaos results in epiphanies and life-changing moments. Sometimes chaos is just chaos. And yes, in the book of Job, it leads to greater understanding of who God is. But the book of Job doesn't end with the situation restoring itself. One of the great tragedies of the book of Job is that Job is restored and given more. But those that he lost are never replaced because he can never get them back. That pain, that suffering does not go away. It is always there. So let me be very clear as I say this. Not all storms or chaos leads to deeper understanding or has a purpose. Not all storms or chaos leads to deeper understanding or has a purpose. That is a destructive theology about God, that every single thing in your life could have a meaning. Sometimes chaos is literally just chaos. It is destructive, it is devastating, it is disorienting, and it is defeating. However, as Christians, we can see chaos as an opportunity. When we are deep within that chaos, when we are deep within the midst of the storm, we can pull back and focus our lives around God who dwells within that chaos. God dwelling in the darkness, God's voice in the thunder, God dwelling inside of that storm waiting for us. So when the thunder sounds, when the storm threatens to destroy what we have built up, then our faith may take a look at that storm and may listen for the voice of God to see if we can gain clarity. It may lead to an epiphany. It may lead to deeper understanding of who God is and who we are meant to be. It may lead to rejoicing. But none of it is guaranteed. But it is an opportunity. So let's go back to the Midwest on the Great Plains where I grew up on the farm. The best part about the storm was standing there after it had passed. When the gentle breeze blows that cooling air onto your face, as you watch the storm move off to the east, out of harm's way, the world seems refreshed. It seems renewed. The grass and the leaves seem a little bit greener. The crops and the buildings glisten with rainwater. The stream gurgles with fresh water. And there's that smell of refreshment across the land while a rainbow often shines across the eastern horizon. It was an invitation to feel more alive after the storm had passed. And that's my hope and prayer for us here today. Whatever storm you're facing... Whatever chaos your life is going through, whatever dark journey is present in your life, may you see the end. May you be renewed at the end. May you look up and see life, and may you feel God's presence anew. May God's grace become more present and more alive in your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.